Of the types of people I run into online that criticize the bell curve, they fall into three rough categories. First, there's the almost completely uninformed type that talk about how IQ is complete pseudoscience and that the author, most don't even know it was co-authored by a Harvard psychology professor, Richard Herrnstein, that the author cites a bunch of supposed Nazis that were funded by the Evil Pioneer Fund. And that's about as much as they can tell you. On the other end are the very rare, usually professional academics that understand that the science is arguably mainstream, but criticize the authors for their conservative political solutions to the problems in society that they identify. They'll also point out that the book shows regressions between IQ and some outcomes that have a very low R-squared value, and they accuse the authors of seeming to imply that the black-white IQ gap is largely due to genes, despite clearly stating that they are agnostic on the matter. And then there's a third type that's one step above the completely uninformed type, the type that cites Stephen Jay Gould in his book The Mismeasure of Man. As Charles Murray puts it, this book is considered the, quote, canonical refutation of the bell curve by non-specialists, despite being written 13 years earlier. Gould's agenda in this book was to counter the concept of, quote, biological determinism, in particular concerning mental ability. As Gould puts it, the argument that intelligence can be meaningfully abstracted as a single number capable of ranking all people on a linear scale of intrinsic and unalterable mental worth. The book is cut into roughly two halves. The first half has to do with 19th century scientists and measurement of skulls and brains. The second half has to do with 20th century scientists and mental testing. This video will be restricted to only one of the core arguments of his book, namely the unreality and supposed fallacy of the G factor, or general intelligence factor, which Gould commits a significant portion of his book to. Before getting into my criticism of Gould on G here, let's address the issue of my personal bias. It seems in discussions such as this, this is at the forefront of people's minds. I won't pretend to not have any bias on this matter, but I believe I can point to evidence that I make great efforts to address these topics fairly and present both sides. My first video on this channel was actually somewhat of a defense of Gould. I read the section of his book about Samuel George Morton and measuring skulls, read the criticisms, then read the criticisms of the criticisms, and decided the issue was totally overblown and Gould didn't fake any data or anything of the sort. This issue about measuring skulls is one of the things he's most accused of, especially in hereditarian circles, yet it is something he did not actually do. Long story short, he analyzed Morton's skull data. He found some possible mistakes, made some mistakes of his own, and also found some odd discrepancies in measurements between those made with lead shot versus those made with mustard seed. This discrepancy seemed to show that Morton, or Morton's assistant, underestimated the skull size of Africans when seed was used. Gould's theory here is that when a less objective measurement technique was used, bias crept into the measurement to fit the expected outcome. Early in this endeavor, Morton moved away from using seed because he realized it produced inconsistent results and started using lead shot exclusively. Gould accepted the lead shot measurements as, quote, objective. So when this 2015 paper from Lewis et al. came out where they remeasured the skulls, this wasn't a massive refutation of Gould because he accepted the lead shot analysis anyway. They found some errors in Gould's analysis of Morton's data, but that's about it. When I started reading about Gould and Morton, I figured it would be a slam dunk against Gould based on what I'd heard people say on this topic. However, once I digested all the information, I came away with mostly the opposite conclusion. So anyway, despite my earlier defense of Gould, I still think Gould and his arguments in the book The Mismeasure of Man need to be responded to in a comprehensive manner. I don't see any thorough critique on YouTube. As I stated earlier, this video will tackle Gould's criticism of the G factor. However, fair warning, this video will probably be the most technical in terms of math and abstract concepts I will ever make. I don't expect this to be a viral hit, but I do think it will be useful as something I can point back to in reference going forward. If you're coming across this video and don't know what the G-Factor is, here's a bit of background. The G-Factor was proposed by English psychologist Charles Spearman in 1904. Spearman observed that the performance of children in school on seemingly unrelated subjects was positively correlated meaning that children that were good at math were usually good at English and whatever other subjects English children were learning in school in the early 1900s. Spearman reasoned that these correlations reflected an underlying general cognitive ability as opposed to specific distinct mental abilities. I found that most people, including myself, have an intuition that they have specific strengths and weaknesses. Personally, I'm better at math than almost any other subject. So the G-factor runs counter to many people's intuition, which makes it unsurprising to me that it was so controversial from the very beginning. To mathematically quantify this correlation of abilities, Spearman invented a statistical technique known as factor analysis. 
The aim of factor analysis is to find latent factors in a data set that can explain the data with fewer variables. Spearman aimed to demonstrate that there existed a general cognitive ability factor, the g-factor, that would explain this correlation in performance on unrelated subjects by these school children. Much more on factor analysis later. So why does Gould spend so much time on the g-factor? Because the implication of g being a real and valid construct means that you could potentially rank people in a linear order according to their measured intelligence. In Gould's review of the bell curve, he argues that the book's, quote, entire argument rests on four supposedly unsupported assumptions about intelligence. These assumptions about intelligence are number one, that it must be reducible to a single number, two, that it must be capable of rank ordering people in a linear order, three, that it must be primarily genetically based, and fourth, that it must be essentially immutable. If the g-factor exists, it would apply that number one and number two are essentially accurate. Gould's criticism of the g-factor falls into two categories. His first line of attack is that adherents of g are guilty of, quote, reification. His second line of attack is much more technical, involving interpretations of factor analysis. Gould spills a considerable amount of ink in his book accusing early pioneers of IQ research of reification of the g-factor. His argument here seems to be that the g-factor is a meaningless abstract mathematical concept and only through misinterpreting it as a real physical object or property of the brain can you then justify its use to linearly rank order people in intelligence. There's two problems with his criticism. First, that if you read the papers and books of the people he's accusing of reification, one can find plenty of quotes that completely contradict Gould's claim here. For instance, a quote from Cyril Burt, quote, to speak of factors of the mind as if they existed in some way as, but in addition to, the physical organs and tissues of the body and their properties is assuredly indefensible and misleading, unquote. Another quote from Charles Spearman, inventor of G, quote, psychology is a science in its own right and can no more fulfill its mission without hypothesis than a man can run properly with his legs tied in a sack. What would physics do without its electrons, its ether, or its heat? none of which are, perhaps even can be, directly perceived. Indeed, there is no necessity for believing that such entities really exist at all. The second problem is that the accusation of reification is in some sense meaningless in terms of the basic scientific method. Much of Gould's criticism obscures the truly scientific approach to this field. Stripping away all the theorizing about what IQ and G really is still leaves you with these facts. First, what is IQ? IQ is a number you get from the output of a series of tests. From the most commonly used tests, this number correlates with commonly used metrics for university performance at 0.5 and job performance at 0.4. That's it. This is true. You can say that IQ is not intelligence all day, but this fact will still be true. As Jordan Peterson, Toronto psychology professor, says in one of his lectures, is something real. It's real if you can measure it and it helps you predict. This is the very core of science, predictive validity. If you want to challenge IQ, find some other method of quickly obtaining a metric that correlates with university and job performance as high or higher than IQ. The existence of the g-factor is also an empirical question. How do you run this experiment? You take a large sample of IQ tests from a representative slice of the population. You then find the degree to which each IQ test item, or collection of very similar test items, correlates with other tests. The more diverse the type of tests, the better. You are then left with a matrix of correlations. You run this matrix through a factor analysis. So hold that thought. You may be asking, what the hell is factor analysis anyway? To really understand what the g-factor is and what factor analysis is, consider this example. Say you have a large group of maybe 100 experienced male weightlifters. I'm restricting this to experience to preclude any beginners that would throw off the statistics, and to male because females will have much more lower body strength as compared to upper body strength. The reasoning for this will become apparent in a moment. So you collect the data by having each of these 100 weightlifters do their one rep max, the most weight on a certain lift they can execute execute one repetition but no more. They do this on bench press, military press, deadlift, and squat. You would then take all the data and find the correlations between them. From this you would generate a 4x4 four four matrix as shown here. Each row would be how a certain lift, say bench press, correlates with military press, deadlift, and squat. The next row would be the same for military press, and so on. What factor analysis allows you to do is explain these correlations with fewer variables than the original dimensions of the correlation matrix. This is just a thought experiment, but this could actually be determined in practice. It seems likely that there would be a general strength factor, meaning somebody that can bench a lot of weight could also lift a lot on the other three lifts. The performance on these four lifts would highly correlate with each other. However, there also might be a lower body factor and an upper body factor. These factors would appear if there were a tighter correlation between bench and military press, as well as between deadlift and squat, than between the four lifts generally. Performing the factor analysis on real data would immediately reveal how much each of these factors 
factors best account for the variance in the data. It might be that one factor explains most of the variance, we would call this the general strength factor, or it could be that we'd see two factors that load heavily on either the upper or lower body lifts, and those factors explain most of the variance, with the general strength factor coming in third explaining relatively little variance, or it's possible, but very unlikely, that individual performance on each lift is completely independent of the other, in which case factor analysis would not provide any useful insight. Note that this would require the correlations between lifts to be nearly zero. So what if it turns out that the general strength factor explains most of the difference in weight lifted between various athletes? Does that mean you could rank order them from weakest to strongest? Well, yeah, it kind of does. No doubt some would excel at bench in particular, or deadlift maybe, and these differences would best be accounted for in upper or lower factors. But if this were the case, the best model for differences in weightlifting performance between individuals would be this general strength factor. If you were to throw women into the mix, there would almost definitely be a large upper and lower body factor, given the significant discrepancy in upper body strength between the sexes. Note that this is a completely empirical question and can't be answered without first examining real data. At this point I'm just speculating as a thought experiment to give you an idea of what factor analysis really is at its essence. To give you an example to put some actual numbers to, let's go back to the topic at hand. Here's a correlation matrix of six mental tests that Spearman administered to 20 students. Each value is a Pearson correlation coefficient. A correlation of one means perfect correlation. This only occurs for the correlations of tests with themselves. A correlation of zero would mean no relationship between the variables, completely uncorrelated. Technically, in factor analysis, the matrix wouldn't have a one in the diagonal. It would be a somewhat lower value, indicating the test's communality. But anyway. Most of these tests are self-explanatory. Pitch is pitch discrimination, so the ability to tell which of two closely spaced musical notes is higher or lower than the other. I'm honestly not sure what music here is in this case, but that's not really important for this example. So I took this data and entered it into this script in a free program called PSPP. This program has an implementation of factor analysis called Principal Axis Factor, which implements the most commonly used algorithm for factor analysis, Principal Factor Analysis. Here are some of the outputs this software provides you. First is something called a scree plot. This gives you a visual representation of the factors in terms of what is called their eigenvalues. Without getting into linear algebra, just know that a common rule of thumb is that a factor with an eigenvalue of less than 1 is considered to be insignificant, so in this case we have one significant factor. The effect of this factor can be removed from the correlation matrix, resulting in what is known as a residual matrix. In this case, there is very little left in the correlation matrix once the first factor is accounted for. In modern IQ tests, the residual matrix will still have some non-zero correlations, which can be accounted for with ability factors such as visual, spatial, or verbal ability. Here is what is called the factor matrix. This shows the factor loadings. In this case, the lone factor is the general factor, or G factor, so these are quote G loadings. This is basically how an individual test correlates with the G factor. And finally, this chart provides the explained variance. For factor analysis, as opposed to principal component analysis, this would be the extraction sum of squared loadings, which is 64%. Although this is Spearman's data, I got the correlation matrix from Arthur Jensen's book, The G-Factor. He did a factor analysis on this data and came up with 62.9% for the explained variance, and almost the exact same G-loadings as I have here. So that gives me some good confidence that the principal axis factor implementation is doing its job correctly. So, without getting into the nitty-gritty mathematical details, that's how factor analysis is done. We have the advantage of having computers to do this stuff today. Principal factor analysis is quite computationally complex. The actual mathematical operations these guys had to do by hand back in the day without even a calculator was fairly brutal. So anyway, almost invariably when factor analyzing a diverse set of mental tests on a large number of people, you have one factor that explains as much or more variance than every other factor put together. It's not uncommon for the first factor to explain more than 60% of the total variance as in the above case. In other words, this one factor explains over 60% of the difference in scores among people taking the IQ test. If 60% doesn't sound impressive, also consider that a certain portion of variance is considered to be due to uniqueness of each test item that is unrelated to any of the factors or other test items. In the above example, almost 30% of the variance was due to this uniqueness, so G explained over 90% of the variance that could be statistically accounted for by factor analysis. When there is more than one significant factor, the remaining common factor variance can be explained by more specific factors, such as visual, spatial, or verbal abilities. Spearman was forced to acknowledge this, meaning that the G factor doesn't explain everything, but it usually explains most of the variance in an IQ test that isn't uniqueness of the tests and error variance.
One of the most commonly used IQ tests is the WACE, or Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale. As you can see here, the G-factor accounts for 52.7% of the variance, four times as much as all the other factors put together. So what does this mean? It means that when you're measuring IQ, you're mostly measuring one thing. There are some other factors, but they're usually very insignificant in explaining the variance left over after you remove G. Keep in mind there's nothing about factor analysis or IQ testing itself that would necessarily lead to this outcome. It didn't have to be this way. But the fact is that a large general factor appears to tell us something very important about human cognition. It means that there is a larger difference on average between individuals and in mental testing than there is between the types of mental testing within an individual. Gould downplays the idea that there's anything significant or surprising about the correlations between mental tests. To quote Gould, the fact of pervasive positive correlation between mental tests must be among the most unsurprising major discoveries in the history of science. However, contrast intelligence with the Big Five personality model. If you have a large group of people take a personality inventory questionnaire and do a factor analysis on the results, you basically end up with the Big Five personality model. Openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Each of these have very low correlations with each other, 0.2 to 0.3 at most. This is because many of the elements in the correlation matrix are very small. Some will even be negative. This is not something you see in the correlations of IQ test items. So you might be thinking now, how can Gould argue with this? Well, he doesn't really. He acknowledges most of these facts more or less. Gould's strategy is to appeal to early arguments made by another foundational psychometrician, Lewis Leon Thurstone. Thurstone took the opposite approach of Spearman, asserting that intelligence was best explained as separate and distinct abilities. He called this the theory of primary mental abilities. Thurstone made significant contributions to the development of factor analysis. Spearman's initial conception of factor analysis is considered quite primitive by today's standards. He was also the first, I believe, to develop a graphical or vector interpretation of factors. He did this by taking the inverse cosine of a correlation coefficient between sets of IQ test items and plotting the angle between these as vectors. Each test can be thought of as a vector, he simply calls them test vectors, and the degree to which the tests correlate with each other can be plotted graphically. Gould explains this very well in his book, actually. On page 284 of the 1996 paperback edition, Gould presents a hypothetical and simplified representation of four IQ subtests and how these tests would correlate with the G-factor. I've produced similar diagrams as shown here. Note how, on the whole, the test vectors are pointing in the direction of factor axis 1. Note also that the vectors correlate with factor 2, but much less so. Also note that the verbal items would correlate negatively with factor 2. A good way to think of this is x-y coordinates. In this case, factor 1 is the y coordinate and factor 2 is the x coordinate. All the factors have very large y values, but small and a few negative x values. Notice how the factors are at right angles, 90 degrees from each other. This is because typically in factor analysis, the latent factors used to explain the data are orthogonal, or completely independent of each other. The cosine of 90 degrees is zero. If there were a third factor, it would come out of the screen at a right angle to the two other factors. The number of factors can be greater than three, but then it becomes impossible to visualize since you're going beyond three-dimensional space. Thurstone didn't like the idea that a mental factor would have a negative factor loading. Therefore, he proposed the idea of something called simple structure. In simple structure, you rotate the factor axis so that you get mostly high factor loadings for some variables, and zero or close to zero factor loadings for others, and ideally no loadings that are negative. As an example that Gould shows on page 285, he rotates the factors about 45 degrees. Again, I've produced a similar diagram. This is a perfectly valid operation, by the way. In factor analysis, there is no objective correct orientation for the factors. In this example, factor 2 is renamed the verbal primary mental ability, and factor 1 is renamed the math primary mental ability. After this factor rotation, it seems that the G factor disappears, and that is what Gould wants you to believe. He wants you to believe G has disappeared, and the correct way to interpret these correlations among IQ scores is as separate distinct mental abilities. This is why he refers to Thurstone as, quote, the exterminating angel of Spearman's G. But G hasn't disappeared at all. It has merely been dispersed to the verbal and math primary mental ability axes. In responding to Gould's analysis here, Charles Murray quoted the late Richard Hernstein as saying, you can make G hide, but you can't make it go away. Whichever way you rotate the factors, the tests still all positively correlate to a significant degree, which is essentially all the G-factor is telling you.
It's important to note here in this graph, notice how the vectors don't really line up with the verbal axis or math axis. If these mental abilities were truly distinct, you'd expect the vectors to cluster around the axis and land on either side. However, this would mean that some of the vectors would be close to 90 degrees separated from each other, which implies a very low correlation, or even negative correlation. But to have test vectors orient in this way would fly in the face of the reality of the g-factor. Mental tests, no matter how dissimilar, positively correlate with each other, with typically very high correlations. Some of the tests will have low correlations, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 perhaps, but to cluster around orthogonal factors in this way would require the correlations to be near zero in each case. This simply does not happen. Thurstone discovered this himself. After collecting IQ test data to prove his primary mental abilities theory, he found that the abilities all correlated with each other to a certain extent. He was unable to come up with a set of tests that would allow neat rotation to simple structure. The positive correlation of mental tests and the concept of rotation to simple structure are simply not compatible. After coming to the realization that simple structure rotation was not working out for mental tests, Thurstone developed the idea of oblique factors as opposed to the usual 90 degree orthogonal factors. This allows the factors to intersect the various clusters of test vectors as shown here. The problem with this approach is that the factors themselves are now correlated. These factors can then be factor analyzed themselves, which produces G right back where we started. This is technically known as a second order G. The first order factors are the oblique factors themselves. Thurstone eventually accepted the validity of G and incorporated it into his models. He kept his first-order primary mental abilities with a second-order G at the top. To quote Thurstone, there seems to exist a large number of special abilities that can be identified as primary abilities by the factorial methods, and underlying these special abilities there seems to exist some central energizing factor which promotes the activity of all of these special abilities. In his 1947 book Multiple Factor Analysis, he states the following in the preface when discussing second-order factors. It seems likely that a second-order general factor determined from correlated primaries may turn out to be Spearman's general intellective factor G. In recounting this revelation with Thurstone, which I'm sure he would have preferred to just sweep under the rug, Gould then makes a tremendous error. Or if he were less charitable, he's simply lying. To quote Gould, second order G, the correlation of oblique simple structure axes, rarely accounts for more than a small percentage of the total information in a matrix of tests, unquote. This is simply false. One of Thurstone's own students, John Carroll, in 1993 published the book Human Cognitive Abilities, a Survey of Factor Analytic Studies. In this book, he concludes that the second order G accounts for about half the common factor variance in a cognitive test, meaning that the G factor accounts for as much variance in the test as all the other factors put together. The term common factor variance simply means the variance in the test accounted for by all the factors. There's still some variance that may be thought of as unique properties of each test item or error variance that are independent of any of these factors. Arthur Jensen found when analyzing the Weschler tests, the second order G accounts for about 80% of the variance as compared to the first principal factor version of G. In these particular tests, the second order G also accounts for two thirds of the common factor variance. Due to some technical issues involving the procedure for extracting the second order G, it does explain less variance than the first principal factor G, but to say it rarely accounts for more than a small percentage of the total information is simply not true. Keep in mind, John Carroll's book came out in 1993. The second edition of Gould's book came out in 1996 with no change in wording on this matter, and anyone in touch with the IQ literature would have known this anyway, even back in 1981 when the first edition of The Mismeasure of Man was published. My guess is that Gould knew he had to downplay the second order G or his whole case would collapse. Most people that read his book will be satisfied with rotating to simple structure to make G disappear. But rotating to simple structure doesn't work given the nature of G, so you have to use oblique factors. But oblique factors bring about the second order G. There is no other choice but to deny the significance of the second order G factor if you're trying to make Gould's case. So, to recap Gould's arguments against G and why they're wrong, reification. Gould goes on and on about this in his chapter, The Real Error of Cyril Burt. In the end, it doesn't really matter what people's personal speculations are in regards to whether G is what you get from a factor analysis or whether it represents some real property in the brain. By the way, the degree to which a test is G-loaded does correspond with brain size, properties of evoked brain potentials, and brain glucose metabolism. But regardless, this is a simple, empirical matter. When you take a diverse set of mental tests and test a representative slice of the population, you get these large correlations between the tests that eat up most of the variance in a factor analysis.
And his second argument about factor rotation, trying to make G disappear by factor rotation has not been a credible notion since at least the 1950s. Thurstone's idea of simple structure and the reality of the G factor are not compatible. Using oblique factors just results in a second order G factor. There was a strong desire among many psychometricians to establish a theory of mental abilities apart from G, but the empirical reality of G prevented this. As Charles Murray puts it, for more than a half century, the holy grail of psychometrics was a set of statistically independent primary mental abilities. Careers were consumed in the search. No one succeeded. As a final note, here's some clips of Jordan Peterson, Toronto professor of psychology, lecturing about these very issues. Neuropsychologists like to think that working memory is something in and of itself, but that's because they don't know a damn thing about psychometrics, generally speaking. There's almost no difference between fluid intelligence and working memory. And the reason for that is that all measures of intellectual function collapse into G. And so we can take a look at what that means. This is from this character here, Carroll, John Carroll. If you want to know everything there is to know about IQ, this is a book that everyone who's a psychologist should, it should, you shouldn't be able to be a psychologist unless you've read this book, in my estimation. There's a couple of key texts, and this is one of them. This guy, Carroll, wrote this thick book. You don't have to read the whole thing because a lot of it's just, in some sense, demonstrations and proof of what he's saying. But what he did for IQ is the same thing that psychometricians did for the big five. You've got the big two at the top. They're not very highly correlated. I think it's about 0.2, something like that. So they're pretty independent. And then they fragment into the big five, and then you can differentiate them further into the big 10. And there really are five different traits because they're only correlated with each other at about 0.2 to 0.3. So really quite distinct. Um, the question is, if you fractionate IQ, how correlated are the things that you fractionate it into? And the answer to that is 0.8 or 0.9. There's one factor in IQ, r roughly speaking. You, if, you, if you take, imagine that you, you took an IQ test and you took, it was 100 items long, and you took the 50 items that were the most correlated with each other, and then the 50 items that were the least correlated with those 50 items. So you broke it into two as much as you could. You maximally differentiated it. You might ask, well, how correlated would the scores be on those two different subsets? And the answer would be like 0.9. Because there isn't two things that you're measuring. Even if you break it up that way post hoc and say, well, it's unfair, but we're going to say because these are the 50 most highly correlated and these are the leftovers, like we're really capitalizing on chance there, you're still going to get an almost identical readout from both sections of the IQ test. And it's just not the same with personality. So, and so this is, this is Carroll's model, basically. Stratum 3, that's the highest level of abstraction, that's fluid intelligence. And then you can break it down into these subcategories of cognitive ability. And you might say, well, how different are those subcategories? And the answer is, not very. If you're high in one, you're very likely to be high in all of them. And so we'll concentrate a little bit more today on <coughs> openness per se. So openness to experience fragments into intellect and openness proper. And I think the right way to think about intellect is that it's the personality instantiation of IQ, roughly speaking. And the reason I think that is because, well, first of all, working memory predicts intellect quite nicely. And working memory tests are very, very highly correlated with G, and specifically G being the first factor that you pull out of any set of IQ tests, right? That, that's the technical definition of G. You set up sis, uh, sets of questions do a factor analysis and extract out the first factor, which is roughly equivalent, by the way, to the total or to the, to, to the mean of the, of the items. If, it's, if there's a one-factor solution, it's not much different than the average. So the average is actually a factor that's, that, that where the hypothesis is that every single item loads equally on that factor, right? Because you're adding them all up and then dividing them by the number. So it's no different than a factor analysis. Sometimes you'll hear people, like Stephen Jay Gould did this when he was complaining about IQ back in the 90s. He said, a factor, an a factor analysis like a factor is just a mathematical abstraction. It's like, well, yeah, so is the average. You think, is the average of a set of numbers real? And the answer to that question is, it depends on how you define real. You can use it for certain functions, which is a pretty good definition of real as far as I'm concerned. But